disappointing tradition. Us Washington fans were left underwhelmed with a 20-16 loss to the Los Angeles Chargers by the Washington football team. This is the Burgundy and Gold Review. I'm Jess of HGTR.Nation, joined by Sam of WSH Football 365. Of course, you can find us both on Instagram. And I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack with what just happened with the game. QB cycle already happening. Just weird, underwhelming, out coach performance. I mean, it's it, it just felt like same old Washington to me, Sam. I mean, it. I mean, we're gonna dive in a bit more here, but instant takeaways. I mean, you went to the game. What was it like? It, it wasn't as packed as I thought it was gonna be. The lower bowl was was completely packed, and it was kind of like it, it looked like a normal a normal game. There was a lot of fans there with like Ravens gear on. Like I saw Chiefs, Cowboys, Eagles. Still a lot. I felt like our crowd was like ready, you know, for like a big play to happen. And then, like when Antonio Gibson had that big run, the twenty-seven yarder, like the stadium was loud, and they wanted to be loud. Like this, the everybody wanted something to cheer for, but like. It was just a lackluster performance what came on the field. And, and like you said, it feels it feels like, you know, the Redskins or, or football team of, of yesterday, like the same stuff. It's uh, you can't even write it like another quarterback injury. I, I thought we were going to see like some sort of improvement, like offensively. I predicted a big you know offensive game from us. But, you know, besides we you know the little bit that Heineke and and, and, and Gibson were able to do like. It, there really wasn't much to write home about. Well, the offense was not good enough, simply put, but they weren't even the worst positional group that we put out there, unfortunately. And that falls on the defense, which is what the team has invested in. It's where all the previous draft capital is in. They have big money free agents brought in there, and the defense, I mean, A list coaching and the defense stunk. I mean, there's, I mean, there were good plays, but overall, this group was abysmal yesterday, and it all comes down to the third down defense, which they had their wor- tied their worst game in franchise history for third down defense, allowing 74% by the Chargers on 14, 14 third downs allowed out of 19. That's you're not winning a game like that, and they didn't, and it it, it all starts there, in my opinion. Third down defense was atrocious. It was it was terrible, and and the Herbert, if he if he still had the ball in his hands, would probably still have time as we sit here and record this on Monday. There, the pass rush wasn't getting to him at all, and and you know the secondary seemed out of place a lot of times, and and the linebackers you know continued to show that they're a weakness. It was very disappointing. I you know everybody watched the game, we saw you know the exact same things that we saw. It just sucked. It just sucked, and I expected more. Well, you mentioned the pass rush. They were non-existent. I mean, Montez Sweat had a sack. There were a few play. The run defense was all right on the D-line, but the pass rush wasn't there, which allowed Herbert to sit in the pocket and pick apart iffy blown coverages at ease, easy passes, the linebackers. Linebackers were just running around as far as I'm concerned. There was nothing positive out of them. I mean, John Bostic, that second and 20, he just threw his body at the receiver. And, of course, the tackle wasn't made. Jamin Davis somehow played 50% of the snaps. Didn't see him at all. Cole Holcomb had a lot of tackles, but for what we've been hearing from him out of camp, you wish there was a bigger impact. And in the secondary, there were just too many open guys. I mean, there there were some Chargers drops, but, I mean, there were – it just felt like it was way too easy of a completion to be made. And, I mean, guys like Cam Kerr and William Jackson, we'll get into them in a little bit, but they had good games. But overall, the secondary was just getting cooked alive and it was like it just way 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 too easy for justin herbert to make these passes and i'm not not that we expect an elite secondary but this was a finely coached group last year that was the second best group in football they've only made additions they've only gotten better in terms of their talent and it's only one game so we're going to not try to overreact too much but there's just nothing good out of the defense besides maybe two good performances in the secondary by jackson and curl it was very difficult to watch, and that third and sixteen converted by Keenan Allen was a really, you know, knife, you know, in the side of the team. You just can't give up plays like that, and just, and and expect the team to win. And, and I just, I, I've I've said so much about it already. Like it's, 
it was just a terrible, terrible, terrible performance besides the interception by William Jackson and maybe a couple plays by Cam Curl, like you said. Uh, the only hope, you know, I want to highlight something positive as I'm sitting here kind of looking through the snap counts. And as bad as the team played yesterday, and minus obviously the Fitzpatrick injury, which we'll get into more uh, here in a little bit, the offensive line p- all played 100% of the snaps. Um, so no injuries there, which obviously is good. And it's hard to celebrate something, you know, when they didn't play that well this game. But, you know, I'm just trying to maybe harp on the point that they'll have time to gel uh, if they're all staying together, you know. And maybe that'll leak over to the rest of the team. And, you know, it is only week one out of 17 games. And this team does have a tendency to start slow, whether it be in a game or in the season as a whole. So I don't think this is the end of the world uh, by any means or any stretch of the imagination. But it didn't seem like they were ready to come out and play football. It it really didn't. And I, I thought Rivera was somebody that, like, lit a fire. And, you know, not to say that they don't have one, but, like, they need to, I don't know, they need a pep talk or something. They're somebody light a fire underneath them because <laughs> I don't want to watch that for 17 weeks. Well, you're talking about the offensive line. I thought Chase Rulier, from what I can tell, I, given not that I watch film or anything, this was just a fan's perspective sitting on the couch watching this game. But Rulier looked good. Eric Flowers, I, I'm, he's the starter now since he got 100% of the snaps, 55 snaps compared to Schweitzer's three. So Flowers looked good. But the other three – not so much. I mean, Charles Leno, he kind of looked a bit slow. He had the sack. Oh, it wasn't technically a sack. We had the QB hit given up on Ryan Fitzpatrick that that's knocked him out for the next one to two months. I mean, he like Joey Bosa, Uchenna Nwosu, which whoever hit Fitzpatrick that play, just absolutely got by Leno with such ease. I mean, Brandon Sheriff, our first team all pro that has declined contracts that would have made him the highest offensive paid guard in football guy who's making $18, $19 million this year, which is at least $3 million higher than any other offensive guards. He's having just crushing penalties for an offense that's not good enough or has not proven they're good enough to overcome penalties. I mean, you just look in that opportunity. I believe it was either early fourth, fourth quarter or late third quarter when Sheriff had a hold and then a false start on the same drive and – I mean, your backup quarterback's in. You're already missing Curtis Samuel. The offense, like I said, we, they haven't proven that they're a good enough group that, like, like a sack or a hold, like that can kill a drive for an offense that hasn't shown they can do it yet. And, I mean, obviously, like, penalties happen. You can kind of, like, find a flag anywhere in a play if you really want to look for one. But Sheriff is a first-team all-pro, first one for the team in 20-some years. And for the guy who's making the kind of money he is for how long he's been here, and for how good he is on the offense, he should not be having those kind of penalties, especially in such a short time frame in crucial situations like those. And even just staying on the right side of the offensive line, Sam Cosme, we knew we talked about it as a key matchup, but he was getting beat like a drum by Joey Bosa. And not that we didn't something necessarily expect that to happen, but offensive coaching did nothing to help him out. They left their rookie second round pick, whose worst strength is pass blocking technique against an elite pass rusher. And what do you think is going to happen? I mean, we weren't expecting Cosme to light up the world against Bosa, but his coaching staff did him no favors. They just left him out there, and the result was what you expected. Yeah, and, and like we said in the pregame, uh, the only thing that I can hope that he grants from, or gains from that is the experience. Uh, I, I would obviously like to, would, to see a better showing from him uh, and, and the rest of the offensive line, but, you know, they didn't give us one, so hopefully he can learn from that and press on and uh, perform better against the Giants on Thursday. Now, this is probably a very premature comment here, the, and I just want to make a clarification before I get into this. This is not in, an indication or, or my projection of any of the rookies, but it was not a good day for the 2021 draft class, and considering the first four picks that we have are all guys who are – Essentially, starter, starters at the moment right now between Jamie Davis, Sam Cosme, Benjamin St. Juice, and Diami Brown, four starters that are all rookies getting big minutes. Again, plenty of time for them to both this year and in upcoming years to be the kind of players that the coaching staff have expected. One game is not going to make or break a career. But, of course, that's completely true. 
but none of them had good games. I mean, Jamin Davis, like I said, he, he was non-existent despite him playing 50% of the snaps. Where, I mean, where where is he? Sam Cosme just touched on him. St. Juiced had some all right coverage, but tackling was a huge issue for him, and he was the clear guy that Herbert was targeting in the Washington secondary. Dommy Brown had four targets for one reception and negative two yards. Not that he should have caught all those, but, I mean, like just not – for guys that we are so relying on to be big contributors early on, not a great start for them, I would say. Not at all. And and as we record this, uh, Ron Rivera is actually doing his Monday press conference, and this tweet just popped up on my phone I think is uh, pretty relevant to what we're talking about. This is from Pete Haley, uh, NBC Sports. Uh, Rivera says, I think our young guys played very young yesterday, and I'd agree. Jamin didn't show up a ton. Sam was, quote-unquote, baptized by fire versus Bosa, and the two third-rounders weren't too effective on the outside, uh, talking about St. Juice. So let's see how they bounce back on Thursday. They're all vital. Maybe this is just a wake-up call. You know, like, I'm trying to be positive about it as much as I can, even though that was just a, a terrible situation. I just hope that they learn from it. Maybe this is just a, a wake up call, like, hey, it's time to play football, you know. And I'm still hanging on to the fact that Rivera's teams always start slow, so they just gotta take what they take what they got, uh, take their lumps and learn from them. Well, there's plenty of season to be had, but I mean, now these upcoming games are the games that Washington needs to kind of get. If we're kind of learn about i mean they need to get off to a solid start because they have a tough tough stretch of games in the middle of the season both in traveling and quality of opponents they are playing and these i mean this upcoming month of september are the games that you want you want to come out of this month two and two before you go into your tough stretch of games to really get a gauge on your kind of teams and i mean it's got (laughs) i'm surprised ron's comment came out just as i was going off about that but I guess that's a good transition here. Uh, I mean, I'm glad Ron agrees with with uh, that sentiment that I just echoed there. But something I did not agree with was some of the coaching decisions uh, we saw from Ron Rivera, specifically in the fourth quarter. I think most people know what I'm talking about. The fourth and seven punt on the Los Angeles 38-yard line with six minutes and 52 left in the fourth quarter. That was I mean, I've got a bit I'll say here, Sam, but do you want to hop in on this? I, I just – I want to see Riverbit Ron in that situation, man. Like, you're on the 38-yard line. Uh, obviously, the defense hasn't been able to stop anybody all day. Heineke's created – Heineke and Gibson have been the only spark. I I, I, I don't – I think it was the right call either. I, I don't like – I don't like punting from within the 30 or 40-yard line ever. Like, like, and that tells me that they have their lack of confidence in Dustin Hopkins too. So – Yes, Dustin did account for like half of our points yesterday, but he still missed a 51 yarder, which I feel like he does every single game at least. So I don't think it was the right call. What are your thoughts? Well, here's how I kind of look at the situation here is that, like I said, you're down four at this point in the game. You've already crossed midfield. You're a little bit before it. You're kind of right outside. You're in the tough spot where you're right outside field goal range but kind of you're too far into punt. I mean, they did punt. And I I just, I mean, I hope a, some, a reporter asked a question about this and we can talk about it in a second. Hopefully it pops up in another one of our Twitter feeds. But best case scenario, just like if I was in those shoes, I'm like trying to understand that decision. It's like best case scenario, your defense, which hasn't stopped Los Angeles yet, minus like one drive in the second quarter, Your defense, best case scenario, gets a three and out. Los Angeles punts the ball, and you get the ball back exactly where you just were with less time on the clock. And, I mean, maybe the less time on the clock isn't as big of a factor because you're looking for a touchdown there. But you're banking on your defense, which has not been the defense you need it to be, getting a stop, which did not happen. And, I mean, just put and that that was the last offense possession of the game because the Chargers got the ball and they drove down to like the Washington Ted Yarn line and needed out. And I mean that like you're right there. And it's like it is fourth and seven and it is kind of tough, but it's like that's make or break moments in the game. I mean, moments like those are when you lose, you go back in the game, you're like, we missed one there. Another time we missed one was 
like I said, the sheriff penalties, we had an opportunity to put Los Angeles away. All momentum was in Washington's favor. They didn't even get a field goal out of that possession when they were in LAC territory. And it's like, there were, there's, I mean, obviously the Gibson fumble was brutal, 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 but it's just like, just that, that frustrated me a lot. I remember there were some issues like that last year at the beginning of the season. And when you lose these kind of, these are the discussions we have. And I was just disappointed that we saw that play out how it did. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. And, and, like I said, like you want to see Riverboat run in those in those situations and give your guys the opportunity to create a spark in those make or break situations. I think uh, that you're right. I think that it will be as uh, you know when they sit down and watch tape of the game, they they miss one, or they miss a couple. And yeah, I'd rather lose the game like like trying than instead of like I I, I don't want to say like backing down. Like I just I I don't I don't like not going forward in that situation. I think you should, you know foot to the gas and try to win the damn game uh, and, and create that spark. But coulda, shoulda, woulda. I know one of the big things I was looking for in the game, this is just kind of last thing I want to toss in there before we get into studs and duds and game grades. But I remember in the uh, pregame pod, I was talking about wanting to see Antonio Gibson have a much larger workload, and we got that and more. Gibson was the offense. There's no doubt about it. The offense runs through Antonio Gibson at this point in time. Passing game, receiving game. I mean, the fumble, bad, bad fumble. But he looked good as a runner against a good defense. And it's clear that they have fully now bought into him being the bell cow in both in the passing game and the running game. And J.D. McKissick, besides an eight-yard run, wasn't out there. Jarrett Patterson was in there because – Gibson was getting his shoulder worked on for a few plays, but AG is the offense, and I'm glad to see that they fully invested and put into his potential to work or to use. 20 for 20 carries, 90 yards, four and a half per. Uh, obviously, that fumble, you know, puts a little damper on the situation, and I think he had a drop or two, but. Yeah, uh, offense runs through Antonio Gibson, and I he showed that he can hold up, and I think he's only going to get better. Um, and hopefully, as the offensive line gets better as well, he'll you know get created more opportunities. So for our studs and duds of the game, not a ton of studs that you can really look at individual performances or coaching jobs. We really want to hang our hat on, but I think the first one we're probably going to agree on this. I said Taylor Heineke was a stud. Came in. Again, kind of not last, like thrown into the fire, needing a spark from him, and an offense that was non-existent beforehand finally got some momentum. We got some plays moving. We got He made some plays with his feet, made some good throws, finished with actually a better passer rating than Justin Herbert. Not that he had a better performance, but he had a higher pass rate than Herbert, went 11 for 15, I believe 135 and 1, I want to say. 122. 122, okay. 122 so, and a touchdown, yeah. A good performance from Heineke off the bench, so I'm really interested to see how he'll play with an actual – obviously, it's a short week. we got a game in, what, three days now? But yeah. I'm interested to see how he'll play. Now, actually going into not – going into a game not being the last-minute starter. Right. So, good game from Heineke. Uh, I think I, – I agree. I have him as one of my studs as well, and not, not to – get too off target from the studs and duds, but I think the team will rally around Heineke. He creates a spark uh, that I didn't, I, I, we haven't seen a lot from Fitzpatrick, obviously, because he went down in the first or second quarter, but I, I just, it's Heineke has something that other players don't have. And I think it'll be good for him to have this like short week of preparation going into the Giants game. And this is a good opportunity to uh, turn the ship around. Really the only, I mean, I said Cam Curl had some nice plays, but the only full-on perform, Cam, Cam Curl didn't play enough. I'll talk about that in our duds in, in a sec here. But the only real full-on 60-minute performance that I think is worth crediting as positive on the defense was William Jackson. And there were some worries in training camp about how he performed. We'd, we'd seen clips of him getting beat on social media. Obviously, that is not nearly anything that should contribute to an opinion of how he'll play on the field. But there was a, a little bit of concern about it. Will the money be worth it? Some people still a bit traumatized by how the Josh Norman money was spent and the kind of play we got there. But 
in one week, I mean, he had several pass breakups. He's clearly the best defensive back on the field. I think for both sides, at least in that game, and had a big interception, I mean, his fourth of his career. I know we predicted a big year for him back in the offseason, but he looked good on defense. And, I mean, it wasn't enough, unfortunately, but he had a big turnover and or big takeaway, should I say, and just was looked really solid on some good Chargers receivers. Yeah, it's, it was good. He was a good highlight or a, a, in, a, in a game that didn't have that many. So – uh, William Jackson definitely played well. The interception was pivotal, you know, even though the fumble negated it like directly after. But yeah, it's something that you love to see from your high profile free agent signing. And hopefully the rest of the secondary continues to gel around him. One of my uh, studs I'd like to bring up uh, kind of under the radar, but it's something that we haven't really had in a long time. Uh, and that's a good returner. And I think DeAndre Carter performed pretty well yesterday uh he had three kick returns 65 yards uh, average 21.7 punt returns he had two for 22 averaging 11 he looked really nice on punt returns uh, i know he's had ball control issues in the past but you know yesterday he put the team in a good position if the offense were to do something uh he you know held on to the ball and made some nice moves flipping over to our duds portion of the segment i think you got to start with coaching Washington was just, it felt out coached in offense, out coached in defense, out coached in a head coaching matchup. The team just, they, they weren't prepared. They, they were better. They were out schemed. I mean, there were weird substitutions. Adjustments weren't really made. Really, the only change in wins during the game was Heineke catching fire, and that lasted, not, well, just at least that sh- shift in momentum lasted for about 10 minutes of game time. And there just wasn't anything I really liked out of the coaching game. I mean, I talked about how Turner wouldn't help out Cosme. I mean, he, I thought his play calling was all right, so I won't say it was necessarily bad, but Del Rio was not good on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, on, on the first drive of the season, you've got James Smith Williams and Casey Tuhill as your two pass rushers, I believe on a second or third down in the red zone. Like what, like not that you can't rotate your guys, but on the first drive of the season and in crucial plays, you're it just, didn't make sense. And there was an offsides penalty that didn't help with that. We talked about the weird Rivera decision making, the team just looking lackluster. Coaching just uh, atrocious third down defense. I mean, it was just nothing really good to talk about there. Nothing at all. And it's it's things that you don't want to or you don't expect to happen from veteran coaches like Del Rio and uh, and, and Rivera. Scott Turner, I'm, I'm still not sold on him, but like Rivera and Del Rio have had major success in this league, and you really want to see that talent spill over to the players on the field, and we didn't see that in so many in so many instances yesterday. That can be directly related back to coaching decisions. So absolutely, like it's hard to just say one player – or, or one person because it was a collective effort, but the coaching staff 100% a dud. I think we can both agree at just lumping the whole defense into a dud. I mean, considering the amount of hype they've received this offseason, not that they've necessarily put labels on themselves about being like the best unit, but I mean, all eyes are on this squad to be one of the best in the league. And obviously coaching can have a big impact on the performance of the unit, but for how much talent there is in the defense and for the kind of stuff we saw from them last year, they just need to step up when needed to, and they didn't. And it's like, obviously defense can't carry the team every game. Offense has to have moments where they can take the pressure off the defense. That was an issue last year that was far too big is that the defense had to do everything, but the offense is a little bit better this time around. And it's like the defense, not even, not even that, we need them to take over the game, but in crucial moments, the offense really needed to de- the defense to step up, and it just did not. And it just keeps harping back to those third downs where we just back breaking after back breaking after back breaking conversion given up. And like I said, coaching plays a factor in that, but talent's got to have a role too. And I'm tired of hearing, I mean, I love John Allen. I mean, one of my favorite players, probably the best player in the team, in my opinion. But I'm getting tired of being told, wait till next week to get a good game or we'll get, work this out. And it's like this has happened too many times where the defense is just getting worked for the level of reputation they have. And it's 
just a disappointing, disappointing game. I mean, I, I don't want to talk about the defense anymore. I'll, I'll let you take this, Sam. Looking at numbers here, time of possession for L.A., 36-03. Time of possession for Washington, 23-57. You just can't win like that. And like you said, it goes back to the third down efficiency where they're 14 for 19 as opposed to our offense, third, you know, three for 10. It's it's just not sustainable. Like it, the defense wasn't getting to. I mean, we have so many elite players, so called quote unquote elite players on defense. But like, I don't care how good of any offensive line is. Like it, with the players that we have, we should be able to go up against anybody. And not to say the guys didn't make plays like Montez Sweat had that really nice. Like I feel like he has it once a game. Uh, that nice, I guess, a strip sack. If uh, the one that looked like an incomplete pass, but went through the back of the end zone, we got a touchback, ended up with a fumble. Uh. But yeah, like I, you covered it pretty well. The defense was just atrocious, and they. This isn't even like one of the the better. Like it's a, a good offense, but this isn't even one of the best offenses they're gonna face this year. Like, you want to maybe play against that or play like that against Kansas City? Like, like come on, come on. I mean, you said it. Like, Chargers, very good roster, pretty good team. They deserved to win yesterday. But it's like in terms of talent level, it's like we're, we still got to play the Chiefs this year. We still got to play the Bucks. I mean, we play the Packers. We play the Saints. Like there are good offenses out there that are still to come for Washington. And obviously this type of showing is probably not going to be where the unit finishes up at the end of the year. Six, 16 games, yeah, 16 games still to go. And defense has plenty of time to mix it around. But just not not an inspiring start to the season just leaves a bad taste taste in your mouth so just got to hope for better on thursday against an offense that they need to i want to see a defensive dominant game this game because with how new york played on sunday and for how much we've been laying new york off the hook recently they need to just throw these guys around Absolutely. They go out and win this game. You know, that brings constant confidence to themselves and will bring some sort of confidence back to the fan base. You go 0 2 here, you got problems. There's the, you, I think that's the beginning of a problem. If you don't beat the Giants here, you should have, they should absolutely beat the Giants. It's a prime time game, but they, they have to pull that out. Let's hop into some quick game grades here. The offense, you know, I was kind of hard trying to grade the offense because at times it looked like they looked last year, and at times they're moving the ball pretty well. I kind of I kind of went with a C minus here, a little bit below average, I'd say. I thought they were an okay group. I mean, we didn't really – we had the bad turnover, but they still were able to keep us in the game. They weren't as much of a detriment as they were last year. So C minus for me on the offense. I was pretty close with you on that one. I have a C on offense. Uh, Antonio Gibson played really well. Terry didn't have enough targets, but that that one catch on the sideline was unbelievable. Um, Logan Thomas touchdown was nice. Heineke had a spark. Uh, I, I think there's definitely stuff to build on there, uh, but I still think it was a pretty pretty poor perform or average performance all around. So C for me. For my defensive grade, I have a D plus, uh, just solely for the fact of the turnovers they created. Uh, all around, it was just a pretty, pretty poor performance. Uh, I couldn't get bring myself to give it an F, just because of the turnovers. But you know, we've said enough about the defense in this podcast, and to understand why I gave it the grade that I did. The only thing that kept me from giving the defense an F was that they got two takeaways, and the run defense was solid. I mean, beyond that, not much that we haven't already commented on. But run defense was solid, and they got the ball. They get they got the ball back into the offense's hands. So D for me on the defense. So in the three phases of football on Sunday, the best one for Washington was actually their special team. And in preseason, that would not have probably been the case if uh, you asked what we expected to come out of week one. I mean, Dustin Hopkins went three for four on field goals, I believe. The longest one's the one he missed, but the team kind of put him in a tough position. Got to make that kick, but I will say the team put him in a tough position with penalties leading up to it. But Tressway was Tressway. Had some great punts that pinned Los Angeles back deep in their own territory. 
given it didn't matter because the defense let them drive down the field, but he did what he had to do. And then you talked about DeAndre Carter. Looked good in the kick return game. Looked good in the punt return game. I kind of went with a low B plus here. That Hopkins field goal hurt, but they didn't really have that many miscues, and they they benefited the offense. I mean, they were to flip field position. They were to get the offense in good position, put the defense in a good position. They didn't capitalize on it, but that's not special teams' fault. So I went with a B plus for special teams. Very similar here. I went with an A minus actually. Uh, if Dustin Hopkins hits that fifty one yarder, I would have given them a full A. I uh, really liked what we saw from DeAndre Carter, as as we both mentioned. And uh, Tressway had some nice punts, and there was no issues with the long snapping, which I was, you know, interested to watch the whole game. So, yeah, uh, A minus me for the special teams, and I like the improvement that I'm seeing in the return game. That's all we have for you today, guys, and thanks so much for tuning in. Come back after the Giants game as we break down every detail from the Week 2 matchup. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our YouTube and follow us on all platforms where you can find podcasts. I'm Sam of WSH Football 365, and that's Jess of HTTR.Nation. Both can be found on Instagram. Also, follow us on our personal Instagram for the podcast. That's at the BNG Review. That's at the letter BNG Review. See you next time, and go football team. Thank you.